Isaiah 49. So we often say God is amazing. However, this chapter gives us a chance to see in particular one of the ways in which he shows himself amazing in the way he can encourage his people even in the midst of some of their deepest despair. So let's call this one in vain because it shows us a time in which God is encouraging his people during a time in which they believe that their labor is in vain. Reminiscent of the way that Paul is going to encourage New Testament believers to understand that their labor is not in vain, Isaiah and quite possibly the entire nation of Israel is dealing with the feeling that their labor is in vain here in Isaiah 49. In this chapter that's going to roughly break down into two halves of 13 verses, the first 13 verses offering one level of encouragement to the nation and quite possibly Isaiah, the second half clearly seeming to focus on the condition of the nation. In each section, it's going to start off with God offering encouragement that may not be enough on its own to lift the spirits of his people. Verses 1 and 2, uh, talking about the way in which, really going down to verse 3, it's going to talk about the way in which he is going to call them his servant Israel, in whom he will be glorified. Verse 4, but I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity that I... Uh, it's one of the reasons why I think it may be super personal for Isaiah, even if he is encouraging all of Israel. However, in verses 5 and following, it is going to take the form of uh, thus says the Lord, as he is going to encourage them with three things he is specifically saying. Verse 5, and now the Lord says, as he's going to go on to identify them as those greatly honored by God. In verse 6, he's going to say, I will make you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach the end of the earth. Another, thus says the Lord, picks up in verse 7, where he will say, literally, thus says the Lord, kings shall see and arise. Going on to a third, thus says the Lord, in verse 8, where it's going to say, thus says the Lord, in a time of favor I have answered you. Breaking down even more in the following verses where verse 9 is going to say he is saying to the prisoners, acknowledging the uh, captivity that has been foretold, he's going to say to the prisoner, sorry, he's going to say to the prisoners, come out. Verse 10, adding to that, he will say, he who has pity on them will lead them out. In verse 11, he was talking, sorry, in verse 11, he will talk about the ways in which he will make straight paths for them, leading into verse 12, where he will also say he will call them from afar, understanding that there is a degree of the dispersion that is going to seem to go beyond Babylon uh, to, to maybe some of those far reaches of the earth uh, to where he has already promised that he will extend his salvation even beyond Israel. The Second half of the chapter, picking up in verse 13, where because of all of the encouragement he has given them, they will be encouraged to sing for joy, O heavens and O mountains, for he has comforted his people and he's saying he will have compassion on the afflicted. But in verse 14, Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me, understanding that there are times when we will go into periods of life that are so difficult that a word of encouragement alone may not be enough. Understanding that, God does not give up on encouraging them. Going on in verse 15, to encourage them with a question first off. Can a woman forget her nursing child? A question to which he will essentially, sorry, essentially answer, no. And so likewise, he will not forget them. Moreover, he is going to go on in uh, roughly three illustrations to talk about the way in which their future is going to look a lot better than their present understanding that the tyrants he has used to discipline them are going to be decreasing as their kids, the next generation, or the kids actually born in their misery will be increasing to the point where kings will get on board. And not only will they get on board, verse 23 will say, with their faces to the ground, they shall bow down to you, helping them to understand the degree to which he is about to redeem them out of their current situation. Ending up the chapter with another question. This time, can the prey be taken from the mighty or the captives of a tyrant be rescued? 
Uh, this time the answer is going to be, yeah, actually they can, because that is exactly what God is about to do. He's about to break the hold of the strong to loosen his people out of their circumstances. Ending up the chapter saying, once again, not only is he going to free them, those who have exploited them can expect this future verse 26. I will make your oppressors eat their own flesh and they shall be drunk with their own blood. Uh, quite possibly not talking about literal cannibalism, but to the degree that they sought to consume God's people, they will find themselves having to consume their own resources or the things in which they had hoped in the same way they thought to take from God's people. This chapter, among other things, seeming to give me a better understanding of who God is as an encourager, understanding that his initial words of encouragement were not enough, he did not become discouraged or give up on trying to lift the spirits of his people. Instead, giving them more specifics on how much they were loved and how much they actually had to look forward to, things they could not necessarily see in the depths of their current condition, which is why we sometimes say, my prayer for you is my prayer for me, that in our efforts, God willing to one, want to be encouraging, that he likewise give us the love, the endurance, and the wisdom to encourage those whose discouragement may actually run 